Hey guys, I'm Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Welcome back to my channel, the number one place where you can learn all you ever wanted to or maybe didn't want to know about urology. So today we're doing another episode of Urologist Reacts to Gray's Anatomy. I had no idea that there were so many Gray's Anatomy episodes with urologic issues. So thank you so much to all the people who watch my videos and comment down below and tell me all these great episodes. So this was actually recommended by a couple of my awesome subscribers. This is season three, episode 21. I did used to watch Gray's Anatomy me once upon a time, but it's been quite some time. I do remember the characters a little bit and kind of what their roles are, so that is helpful when I'm watching these. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and don't forget to hit that notification bell so you don't miss out when I release a new video. I typically try to release videos every Monday. All right, well, let's get going. Richard, finally. Oh, for God's sake, what are the four musketeers doing here? What happened to all be discreet? Larry, they're here for the same reason I am, to see if they can help. All right, bunch of ghouls. All right, one of you wants to be the new chief. Fix this. You got my vote. I know those are not grapefruits. Well, it looks as though you won't be needing my services after all. Mm. Supra-pubic tenderness. That's because I haven't taken a leak in three days. Three days. Could be a hernia. A hernia wouldn't do that. What's it, trauma? A testicular torsion? No. Twisting? Twisting? You'd have to time in a triple knot to get that kind of fluid buildup. Am I wrong? I was taking a two-week raft ride on the Amazon. Oh, maybe it's a tropical disease. Mm. Schistosomiasis, filariasis. Oh, no, they're just guessing. Mm. Richard? <sighs> Dr. Bailey. Call Dr. Fisher in urology to do a super pubic calf and order an ultrasound in KUB. Larry, have you called Nancy? I don't want to worry my wife unless I have to. She wasn't on a trip with you? Okay, there's a lot going on there. So, looks like he has scrotal swelling and urinary retention. What shocks me about this is this guy hasn't peed in three days. He would be in so much pain. He would not be just sitting there comfortably talking to them about how he hasn't peed in three days. And the first thing you would do is put a Foley catheter or a catheter in the bladder through the urethra. They did mention a few things. So first they talked about testicular torsion. So typically that's a surgical emergency where the cord to the testicle twists and it causes severe testicular pain that sometimes can have nausea and vomiting associated with it. It doesn't typically present with urinary retention, and it's more common in younger kids or younger boys rather than adult men, although we do see it in men occasionally. However, this guy sounds like both of his testicles are swollen, so I think that's unlikely. Second, they talk about some tropical diseases like schistosomiasis and filariasis. So schistosomiasis is a parasitic disease that's very common in places like Egypt or other tropical areas that causes chronic irritation that can cause urologic problems in patients who've had it for a long time. So it can cause things like blockage of the ureters or the tubes that drain the kidney into the bladder, or it can over long periods of time in patients who have chronic infection, it can cause bladder cancer. Again, I don't think that's the case here because he's only just come back from the Amazon. The second thing they talk about is filariasis. This is also another parasitic disease very common in tropical areas that's due to a mosquito bite. This can cause fluid buildup and in the genital urinary tract it can cause testicular swelling. But again, this happens after having the disease for quite some time in a chronic setting. And the last thing they mentioned is that his wife didn't go on the trip with him. So I'm guessing they're going down the route of a sexually transmitted infection or an STI. And the last thing is they mentioned getting an ultrasound, which is a great test, a testicular ultrasound to assess the blood flow to the testicle, if there's any exactly where the fluid buildup is, if there's any trauma to the testicles, and a KUB. A KUB or an x-ray of the abdomen is not something that I typically get in patients with urinary retention. They mentioned calling a urologist for the superpubic tube catheter. That is a procedure that requires an incision on the belly to put a catheter in through the abdomen. So typically we would start with a catheter through the urethra or a Foley catheter. And I'm not sure why they decided to skip that step, but maybe the patient just didn't want something going up his urethra. This is embarrassing, um, mortifying actually. Um... I think I need to be tested. Larry and I, whatever Larry has, I probably have it as well. Uh, 
O'Malley. Yeah. Page, Dr. Montgomery. Okay. okay. They're definitely going down the STD angle or STI angle. Many sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis can cause orchitis or inflammation of the testicles, which result in swelling. Also, a couple of sexually transmitted infections can cause urethritis, which can cause inflammation of the urethra or the tube that drains the bladder. And this can sometimes result in urinary retention, although it's very uncommon. I'm not really sure we're going to find an STD here. However, the testing for this would really be a number of urine tests and blood tests to check if any of these infections are actually present. And you start the patient on a couple of antibiotics, which tend to treat 90% of sexually transmitted infections, and then follow up to make sure their symptoms resolve. Richard, this thing still hurts like hell, and my boys here are not getting any smaller. I want to know what you're doing about it. Well, the urologist just drained your bladder. Next up is an ultrasound and an X-ray. The interns will be taking no, up. No, 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 no. I mean, what are you doing for me? Getting some of the best surgeons in the world to help you. I came here. Oh, some tasks. Hmm. And no way Jennings has that. Did you check for brucellosis? Oh, it could be the beginning of 40 inch game green. I don't know. I could go to gonorrhea before I went there. Then again, I'll be there at the finish line to make it pretty, which is what I'll remember. <laughs> so I think it's so funny. And I get this is like a VIP patient who's figuring out who's going to be the next chief of surgery. So everyone's involved. But in real life, a neurosurgeon and a cardiothoracic surgeon and probably a plastic surgeon would not be involved in this case at all. Nor would they have the familiarity to really handle a case like this. And they're, again, throwing out a bunch of different really vague diseases. Brucellosis doesn't really have any urologic manifestations. Elephantiasis is actually filariasis, which they mentioned earlier. And gonorrhea is definitely possible. It's a sexually transmitted infection that could, again, like we talked about earlier, could cause these symptoms. Hey, just so you know, I'll be over here while you're over there, okay? Cute. Easy to locate, right? Mm -hmm. Girlfriend comes with the GPS. Hmm. Looks like some kind of foreign object. Ouch. That almost looks like a skeleton. Yeah. It's skeleton like, definitely skeleton -y. Are those barbs? No. Can't be. Well, it could be. It looks like a teeny tiny catfish. It's close. You see there? Those are spines. This is a kandaroo fish. The penis fish? This guy has the penis fish. In his, in his, wow. Well, I, so I've heard of this fish before, but I really don't know anything about it. So give me a second. Let me look this up. I have to say, they made a really cool x-ray of this fish, which looks like it's, I guess, lodged in the bladder at this point. So when I looked it up, I found that there is actually one documented case of a kangaroo fish actually lodging itself into a patient's urethra. And the story goes that the patient was urinating in the Amazon and the fish leaped into his urethra and then he had to have a urologic surgeon remove the fish with an open surgery. But there's actually been some questions if this has actually been told truthfully because some marine biologists have looked into this and it's actually impossible for a kangaroo fish to physiologically jump into the urethra and swim against the flow of urine to lodge itself into the urethra. Also, while there's some myths that these types of fish are actually attracted to blood and urine, when they did studies looking at these fish and how they are attracted to the chemicals in urine, they found there was no attraction at all. So I think this is just a big myth, but it, there is one documented case. So let's see what they do here to remove this, uh, to remove this fish. It's the kangaroo. It's a freshwater fish that lives in the Amazon. It's a parasite. I'm not an idiot. I didn't drink from the Amazon. Did you urinate in no, it? What? The kangaroo is attracted to blood and urine. It's been known to swim up the stream of urine and lodge itself in a man's urethra. Even a fish swam it's up? It's rare, but there are documented cases. One man actually saw it go in and try to grab it. It's too slippery. Yang. It's in the literature. So this thing it's is in It's now my... in your bladder. Well, right next to it. It's stuck in your uh, prosthetic urethra, which is causing the obstruction. We need to get it quickly before it causes sepsis. Sepsis. You mean I could die?
The x-ray that they showed earlier actually shows the fish, and based on this x-ray, I would assume that that fish is in the bladder. If it was actually in the prosthetic urethra, it would actually be lower down on the image, kind of like right here. So that's one thing. The second thing is he looks pretty well right now. I don't think he's at imminent danger of being septic right this second, but yes, you would want to try to remove this fish in an urgent fashion. So we do see people lodging things up their urethra occasionally. It can be either because they're doing it for pleasure or because they've done it for some sort of college dare and those things we do remove in an urgent fashion. So typically what we do to start is we try to go in with a camera, the cystoscope that goes into the urethra and we try to grab it with some graspers and pull it out. If we can't do that we sometimes have to make an incision in the abdomen or the perineum depending on where the item is located. So I had one case like this in residency where someone actually lodged a toothbrush up their urethra and when they couldn't pull it out they broke the toothbrush. So then there was a free floating piece of the handle just kind of lodged in there and we were able to take it out with the cystoscope and the grasper. So please try not to put things up your urethra because it can be a real problem if it gets stuck. What about the fork stone grasper? It can lead to urethral injury. Well, the forceps aren't working at this point. I'm willing to try anything. All right, stone grasper. Okay. Come Did in. we miss anything good? Does he have a pulse at that? Oh, he's going down. Yes. He needs one to be in the other room. How much longer do you think it'll take? Uh, you worry about getting his arrhythmias down. Look, we're gonna have to change our game plan here. The scope isn't working. Excuse me, Dr. Fisher. We're gonna have to open him up. I'm not really sure what grasper that was that they were using. The fork stone grasper. That's not something I've actually ever heard of. And the one that they showed is actually a laparoscopic grasper. So it's used for a different type of surgery altogether. This is a case that's typically done by urologists and we're the experts in this area. So you wouldn't really need help from everyone else that's in the room there. Certainly you might require some help from another urologist, but typically for the cystoscopic stuff, we know that stuff more than any other specialist in the hospital. The decision to open the patient would also be on the urologist who would be deciding when it's appropriate to go ahead and move forward with the next step of the operation. And depending on exactly where this fish is, you would either make an abdominal incision if you needed to go into the bladder, if it was in the prostatic urethra or more distal towards the tip of the penis, you might make a perineal incision to get to the urethra from that angle as well. So again, it really depends on where exactly the fish is located. A little more suction there. Those barbs won't let go. Dr. Bailey, glad you could join us. No, oh, this is useless. I'm gonna have to cut it out, Dr. Fisher. I'll repair the bladder. Okay, let's do it. How's this heart holding up? Occasional okay, runs of VTAC. Wait, 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 wait. Did you guys see that? on the screen there, right there, they're still showing the cystoscopy image on the screen. They forgot to take that off. Awesome. Okay, almost there. Come on, you. Yeah. Almost there. Got it. Holy. That's horrifying. But typically so, what we would do after this is just close the bladder and he'd probably have a catheter in the bladder that he already had, which is a suprapubic tube catheter that goes in from above the belly into the bladder that way. And he would have a catheter that goes in through the urethra. And while things are healing, he might have both catheters in place. Depending on the damage that was done, you leave a catheter in for any anywhere from one week to three weeks. And then you'd remove both catheters, make sure he's urinating okay and take those out. But overall, great episode. I learned something new today, and I hope you guys did too. Comment below, let me know what you thought of the episode, and if you have any other recommendations. I am keeping track of all the things you guys are commenting about. I have a list that I keep with all the episodes and things you guys want me to react to, all the videos you want me to make. I will do my best to get to all of them for you guys. So thanks so much for supporting me. To those of you who think I look like a brown Teddy Altman, thank you so much. She is stunning, and I feel honored that I'm even remotely look anything like her. So thank you so much. Thanks as always for watching and always remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it.